Good evening, Gerald, and thank you very much for giving some of your time to, to the Mint to discuss your great book, Busting the Bankers Club. Thank you very much for having me. Great pleasure to be here. Well, I'd like to start, I suppose it's a, there's a huge amount in this book, and we could be talking for uh, a long time. So, uh, but to, to try and sort of start somewhere, uh, there's one of the things that seemed to me in reading the, the first sort of section was the fact that the strength of the bankers club that you talk about uh the group of people who are sort of behind the, the lobby uh the lobby uh group seems to have strengthened quite substantially that although it has odd moments of crisis uh it sort of comes back but it's like i think you said that after the great financial crisis it's sort of it's strengthening to have gone back after two or three years as opposed to after the uh, uh, the Great Depression uh, when it took decades for it to regroup. Is that the sort of trend, do you think, an uh, uh, overall trend with, with blips? Or, uh, uh, and if so, why? Yeah, well, the, the Bankers Club, uh, as, as you said, is, is the group of, of uh, economists and lawyers and uh, politicians and uh, CEOs of non-financial corporations and others who uh, are on the team, team bank, big team bank. bank. Yes. Team <laughs> bank. Uh, and just to clarify, when I talk about banks, what I'm really referring to is financiers, the, the, the mega financial institutions. So it, it also includes the hedge funds and the private equity firms and the asset managers and so forth. But yes, um, and the, uh, the, the groups are really crucial to the strength of the political strength and the economic strength of the financial community. And I think it has strengthened significantly uh, since it's, it, the Bankers Club 1.0 collapsed in the Great Depression. And it took you know, 20 or 30 years for them to regroup. Uh, and now they're very, very strong in the United States. And it's very hard to get any significant um, legislation passed to regulate the banks in a serious way now. Yeah, I was sort of amazed, actually, that after the great financial crisis, you got anywhere. I mean, what was the, in that sort of process, uh, um, what was the leverage that you could draw on to actually counter the huge resources and power that, that this club had? Well, the great financial crisis, uh, as, as you know, in 2007, 2008, generated the worst uh, recession uh, in the United States since the Great Depression. Uh, millions of people lost their homes. Uh, thousands of people lost their jobs. And people in the United States uh, were really mad. They were really angry at the banks. And uh, this uh, was made worse by the fact that the US government chose to spend billions of dollars uh, to bail out uh, the, the big banks. And uh, as the saying went, they um, they bailed out, bailed out the banks, but they didn't bail out Main Street. You know, they bailed out Wall Street, but not Main Street. And so there was a lot of political uh, agitation. And in fact, that was one of the reasons why um, Barack Obama won the election, because he uh, came out against the banks. But having won the election and having to deal with this, this um, great concern among the population, uh, it was they had to do something about re-regulating the banks. And there was a lot of strong opposition from senators like uh, um, Jared, Sherrod Brown in Ohio and others, uh, and Obama had to do something. And so I, I think it was the kind of mass anger that we also saw during the Great Depression, which helped to explain why FDR Frank, uh, uh, was able to pass the New Deal re regulations on banking at the same time. But I suppose that then is the question they didn't do as well, because obviously FDR seemed to have a, a huge impact and made a huge change, whereas the uh, the Dodd-Frank's uh, um, legislation didn't. Is that right? But That's right. What, what was so the part big... of the book? Yeah, part yeah. of the book was to try to explain that difference. Um, so for one thing, uh, during the Roosevelt administration, um, the Federal Reserve had, had been uh, uh, 
totally di disorganized and totally di um, uh, its reputation. The Federal Reserve was was destroyed uh, in, in the, when the Great Depression hit um, because they had they had done nothing to try to stem the the, the Great Depression. So uh, I didn't mention earlier that, that one of the um, the chairman of the Bankers Club is actually the Federal Reserve. They're the ones who help uh, unify and organize the Bankers Club. Uh, so they were out of the picture in in, in the 1930s, whereas um, this time around, uh, Obama had put uh, Tim Geithner and these other uh, big central bankers um, in, in charge of, of the, the the bailouts, Ben Bernanke and others, number one. Number two, during the, the 1930s, there there's quite a significant division between non-financial corporations on the one hand and the bankers on the other. And so, in fact, a lot of industrial companies who had been hurt in the Great Depression supported Roosevelt, or at least didn't fight Roosevelt on a lot of these uh, New Deal banking regulations. Whereas one, a big change was that by the time the great financial crisis of 2008 came around, um, there was almost no space between non-financial corporations and the financial corporations. They were a, a more unified whole. One of the thing, chapters in my book, I try to explain that. So there was not that much division. And finally, the biggest banks really had dominance over the medium size and the smaller banks politically in Washington. And so there wasn't there was a unified front, both within the banking community pretty much, and between finance and industry pretty much, which made it um, uh, much more difficult for the Obama administration to put through very serious uh, financial reforms. But in the end, Obama really didn't want to put serious financial reforms through. Um, he just wanted to uh, to uh, get the financial system up and running again, more or less the way it had been before, and 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 let it uh, let it doing its thing. So there wasn't the real push to totally restructure finance uh, in 2007, 2008, the way there had been during the Great Depression in, in 1930. And why? Did FDR recognize the need for substantial change? And Obama didn't seem to need, didn't seem to recognize that. I think part of it has to do with the um, the people that, fit, that FDR uh, surrounded himself with, the advisors, um, and um, who really saw finance as having uh, caused major problems, uh, not only the depression itself, but we're really blocking all kinds of social reforms and economic reforms to get people back to work, to restructure the economy. Um, and so I think they explicitly, in, in the 1930s, really wanted to break and transform the, the political power of, of, of the financial in, uh, institutions, JP Morgan and, and the robber barons and so forth. Whereas Obama, um, and the Democrats re uh, saw the well, big finance as a huge political supporter. Ca campaign contributions uh, had always been a big part of the Democratic uh, coalition. And so they were very reluctant, both the Democrats on Capitol Hill as well as Obama and his people, to, to really uh, break that connection between the Democrats on the one hand and, and, and finance on the other hand. It didn't necessarily work that well because um, uh, the bank, the finance and the bankers club didn't want any regulation. Um, so they were still pretty angry at Obama and the crew, but they were able to patch it over and still get their fi uh, financial contributions um, from, dem from the banking industry and so forth. But the finance was a much stronger part of the democratic coalition under Obama than it had been uh, 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 under uh, Roosevelt. Was that one concept you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, that is the idea of social capture. Was that part of the story that they 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 sort of the the narrative that supported finance and private sector all that and was ultimately good, etc., had a huge sort of social power as well as just the um, the sort of political coalition, if you like. You know, the, um, 
the social capture is, is is an interesting concept and it means that you know you want to be part of the in group you want to be part of the powerful group and if you're a young uh, lawyer or a young economist or a young politician and you want to rise uh, up in your profession um it's it's a lot more fun uh, in washington and elsewhere to be invited to the elite parties and uh, uh, be part of the in crowd and there is this kind of reluctance, even if you're uh, critical, you don't want to be so critical that you, you're just put on the, on the outside. And I think that is a powerful force in any elite uh, elite organization. And I think finance and the Bankers Club is certainly, uh, certainly part of that. But um, other kinds of capture also important. We talk a lot about regulatory capture and uh, the way in which the revolving door um, um, in regulatory agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission or the uh, control of the currency and, and the other regulatory agencies, very important. That is, they hire um, the, the 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 banks hire former members of of the regulatory agencies. They hire former members uh, and staffers in Congress, in the Senate, and in, in the executive branch, of, and they offer them high paying jobs. And then uh, they send uh, their uh, mem their members from from banking in onto those jobs, and so it's this revolving door, and this leads to way too much. Um, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back. Kinds of um, activity uh, in the regulatory agencies and on Congress. So there's the, that kind of capture, um, and then there's cognitive capture. Cognitive capture is this mindset that you have to have, you know. A, a deregulated financial system that will create uh, uh, a lot of efficiency, um, a lot of dynamism, a lot of innovation, and economists who are members of the Bankers Club, uh, some economists, mainstream economists, are also very much part of this kind of cognitive capture as well. You know, the Queen of England famously, oh, yes. <laughs> after, the, after the great financial crisis, Asked the economists at the London School of Economics, you know, what what happened to you all? You, you didn't you didn't tell us this was going to happen, and and part of the, the issue was this kind of cognitive capture. They thought finance was efficient and and would rising tide would raise all boats. I'm just I'm going to come to that sort of obviously to discuss the whole state of the economics profession, etc. In one moment, but just going back to Obama's failure, if you like, uh, um, to properly regulate the finance sector. Was that somewhat the, the basis for Trump? And, you know, because he obviously hadn't drained the swamp, if you, uh, if you know what I mean. And is that still um, an issue that that you think energizes people in the Trump base? Well, it certainly was a huge thing that energized them after the great financial crisis, and that I think led to some of the movements that Trump exploited. So you, um, uh, there was this movement during the, the 2008-2009 um, aftermath of the crisis called the Tea Party movement. And again, their big thing was, you know, the government bailed out Wall Street, but they didn't bail out Main Street. And uh, they became very angry at at the government supporting the banks. And when Trump was running for president, among other things, he also railed against the banks, you know, Goldman Sachs and this and that, and really tried to, and, and against the government, and really tried to to, to ride the coattails of, of that movement. Of course, soon after he got elected, he appointed all these Goldman Sachs executives to his administration. He started talking about, well, they're my bankers. They're not, you know, <laughs> anchors. These are good people. Um, so he exploited that. Uh, but it's it, he he um, he became a member of the Bankers Club. In fact, Trump became one of the biggest members of, of the Bankers Club, pushing more deregulation and so forth. But he exploited that as he's so good at doing. It's extraordinary what he gets away with, isn't it? I, I wonder why his base, how his base is able to to allow, you know, to, 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 to basically accept these uh, huge changes in direction, if you like. 
Yeah, that's a whole new other book I'd have to write. That is another book. Okay, <laughs> let's do. Let's, uh, let's move on because I was keen to talk about the economics profession, shall we call them, uh, uh, um, and where things are at. Because, you know, going back, obviously, the Queen's question, and, uh, and then after the crash, there was the sense, obviously, that things might change. Um, and uh, economics might be taught differently, uh, and um, the dominance of mainstream economic thinking may reduce. And I just wondered where you thought the situation was now. Um, I mean, I'm sort of interested because at the moment, the sort of, I suppose you can see that industrial strategy is now a thing, which obviously is not really a mainstream economics thing. And Harris is talking about pricing controls, isn't she? But on the other hand, austerity, certainly in the UK, seems to be alive and picking as a, a, a balancing the books and uh, you know all those sorts of things. So where, do, I mean, where do you see that sort of battle of ideas um, and the state of the economics profession? Right, so um, stepping back just one minute, uh, I, I wanna just mention that the book is not just about my book is not just about the, the bankers club but it's uh, importantly also about what i call the, the club busters that is um the groups in, of lawyers and we've talked about uh, politicians um uh, uh and activists who fight against the the bankers and try to re reform finance in a way that serves society as a well. whole and this is true also among economists that is um, there, there has been this kind of what I call bankers club economics, which roughly speaking is neoclassical, neoliberal economics, uh, which argues for the, the magic of the market and uh, the dangers of, of too much state intervention in the market. And that was really, I think, dominant for sure, in, certainly in the 1990s and, and 2000s. But there's always been, of course, this, the, the club buster economics, economics yeah, yeah. the paradox economics, the um the marxist economists the post keynesians and institutionalists and others that have had uh, had footholds in the academy in different places um it used to be in in, in cambridge but now in, in greenwich uh, uh there's a lot of great there's a great program in, in the uk greenwich economics department there um, in the united states my uni university university of massachusetts and the new school and others um and uh uh i think the for a long time, uh, these heterodox views were kind of shut out, and that certainly in the 90s and, er and early 2000s. But as you suggested, uh, it's, it has been making a bit of resurgence, I think. I think there's been a just general dissatisfaction with uh, neoliberalism and um, the, the problems it's caused in terms of inequality, uh, stagnation, and so forth. Um, and that new ideas like industrial policy and uh, managed trade and uh, wealth redistribution, et cetera, importance of more power for unions, et cetera, um, has taken hold. And certainly, uh, I hate to give him any credit, but to some extent, Trump was pushing some of these non neoclassical ideas, non neoliberal ideas. And, um, and Harris and Biden are continuing with. Uh, with these more of these ideas, and I think naturally you see more heterodox economists um, uh, in the administration. In the Biden administration, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Jared Bernstein, uh, uh, a major economist there, head of the Council of Economic Advisors, is a heterodox economist. He he worked at the Economic Policy Institute, grew up in that in that tradition. Thea Lee in the Labor Department, many people um, in the Biden administration come from, from the heterodox economics background. So I don't know if Harris were to be reelected, if Harris were to be elected, whether she would continue with this, but there's clearly been progress. Now, where progress is slower, and I'll, I'll stop in a minute, is in the academy itself. Yeah. <laughs> you look at the top institutions, you know, MIT, Harvard, Stanford in the United States, and you have similar ones. Uh, in the UK and elsewhere, uh, they're very reluctant to embrace alternative um, paradigms in economics. 
they will take some good ideas from the heterodox. They've always done this, taken good ideas from the heterodox approaches, and then somehow kind of claim them as their own and integrate them into their own models and so forth without acknowledging uh, where they come from and um, their, their radical roots. And they're very, the mainstream is very good at it, but they have a monopoly. The five top universities with control the five top journals, the jur getting into the five top journals determine whether you can get tenure or even a position at one of these top universities. So it's, it's really a cartel in a certain sense, a self-reinforcing cartel. Um, but they're not uh, shy about grabbing some ideas uh, from the heterodox side and, and using it on their own, which I guess is it's better than not using those ideas at all. <laughs> yes, uh, as long as they can be mathematically represented. <laughs> There's that also. Uh, yeah, I am wanting to come to the busters uh, to give them uh, the space because I think your uh, uh, coverage of all the different groups who are trying to fight for change uh, is really interesting and also, of course, hopeful. Um, and and you know maybe they will have more influence in the future. I'm just one of the things you discussed was, I suppose, um, change by lots of incrementalism versus revolution. Um, and so, and, and I wondered because you seem to come down on a more incrementalist than revolutionary because obviously revolution all sorts of things can happen revolutions um so but you also talk about i suppose the period after the great financial uh crisis and how a lot of the it seemed to me as i understood it a lot of the loss or whatever happened in the fights over the detail because it was just too complicated and uh, people couldn't engage with it, etc. Um, so I wondered, how do you think you can incrementally weaken the bankers club without losing, I suppose, the power of popular anger, interest, etc. Because you get each battle gets more and more sort of uh, uh, complicated and obscure, like after the, the, the great financial crash. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, I'm not against revolutionary change, but, I'm, <laughs> right. but, but I, I am I am against just uh, those who say we just need to sit around and wait for the next crisis and and not do anything between now and the next crisis because it takes a crisis to bring about revolutionary change. And I think my reading of history is that if there is positive change as a result of a crisis, it's because of all the enormous work that has been done by activist movements and uh, and and others uh, between crises uh, to build up institutions, to create ideas, to build up uh, social forces and so forth that can take advantage of, of the next opportunity. So um, that's what I'm kind of arguing for. And I think in terms of finance, particularly, it is can be a, a technical and very daunting kind of area. Uh, and um, uh, so you do need, to create institutions that can move forward to create incremental change as you're developing um, uh, some kind of momentum for change that can really perhaps take a, a more a radical or, or a more structural um, place when there's a crisis of some kind and brings popular attention back. So we're in that kind of interregnum now. Um, you know, there hasn't been a great financial crisis for a while. The financial system is sort of slowly but surely eating away at at, uh, um, at, 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 at people's livelihoods in a certain way. Um, and what we need to do is, is, is support the institutions that are really fighting against it. So for example, um, there are groups in Washington, and I know you have groups also in the United Kingdom. Um, in, the, in Washington, it's called Better Markets, Americans for Financial Reform. Um, these not-for-profit groups that really are trying to um, bring to tow like private equity firms and all the all the, all the bad things that they're doing in hospitals and and doctors' offices and nursing homes and so forth uh, that try to um, hold at bay the, the the powerful movement for cryptocurrency, which is really 
taking on a big political role and trying to hold them at bay, et cetera. Um, but then we have the regulatory agencies, which remarkably, some of them have become uh, quite active, like the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, under Gary Gensler and some others. So we have to try to support them and protect them from, from Congress that's trying to, to prevent them from doing their work. So call your congressperson. And then I talk a lot about the public banking movement here in the United States. Yeah, so that's really interesting, I think, as a and, sort of creating an alternative. forces with them to, public, to try to create public banks. You know, uh, we, we only have one uh, public bank in the continental United States. It's in North Dakota. Um, but there are movements in California and elsewhere to, to, to try to create public banks that will, will give more credit for affordable housing, green energy, et cetera. Um, so these are all, I think, incremental things that that create institutions that then can uh, be the basis for more radical change when the time comes. Yeah, I love your phrase, uh, banks without bankers. Uh, maybe just quickly sort of explain what's the difference between a public bank and the mainstream private banks? Well, I use the term public bank kind of broadly. Oftentimes it's used to mean state-owned bank. Um, so, for example, the Bank of North Dakota is owned by the state of North Dakota. But I use the term more broadly to mean um, banks for, for whom the major goal, the major uh, mandate is not maximizing profit, but um, it's uh, achieving some kind of social goal, but of course with a profit constraint or a uh, a revenue constraint. They have to survive and reproduce themselves, but that's not their main goal. Their main goal is, is providing some kind of social good, be it um, affordable uh, bank accounts and services for, for marginalized communities or investing in, in uh, for example, affordable housing or green energy, that they have some kind of social mandate um, along with their requirement to, to make enough money to survive and reproduce themselves. Uh, so they could be pub publicly owned, government owned. They could be public-private partnerships. They could be non-profits, not-for-profits, like um, uh, um, community banks and so forth. So they're not all, they're not just state-owned banks. They're they're banks with a mission. Yeah. So do you think there's more space now for? like a mission-led banking sector or uh, a growth in mission-led banks? Um, it, yes and no. I think yes in the sense that I think people are more motivated to try to create these things. But no in the sense that they um, have to operate with two arms tied behind their backs. If you think about Wall Street banks, the, the big banks, whenever they get in trouble, they get bailed out by the government. If they have a liquidity problem, the Federal Reserve is there to, to lend them money, subsidize credit, um, short-term liquidity. Um, the, uh, whereas these these kind of public institutions don't have access to the Federal Reserve lender of last resort. They don't get subsidized by the government the way the uh, big banks are. So we need uh, some national um, regulatory infrastructure and support for these kinds of banks to put them on an equal footing with the too big to fail, the big banks. Um, so there's been some legislation uh, put forward in Congress to, to create a, uh, a situation where these banks get access to the Federal Reserve um, support. Uh, they have a, uh, a, a more regulatory framework that can allow them to prosper and thrive. Without this kind of national support, um, I think it's very difficult for these smaller banks to really thrive and, and grow. And so I suppose we can only hope that future administrations, are, I suppose also you'd have to get it through Congress and, and, and the Senate, which can often be a, a, a challenge, can it? That's right. And is there anything in the agenda that suggests that um, if uh, Harris wins next, there might be support for this sort of thing, or at least people involved in the administrative team or that might? Well, I think uh, the first thing is to get Harris elected to prevent uh, a total fascist takeover of the United States. So that's the first thing. Then uh, where she, if she's elected, which I hope she is, 
um, then there's going to be a big battle in, in the Democratic Party about, you know, what kind of economic and social policy uh, she's going to implement. And um, I think uh, I'm hopeful that the more progressive forces uh, will have a, a strong um, uh, uh, influence over her policy, you know, Bernie Sanders and AOC and the other progressives uh, in the United States. Um, uh, I think that uh, remains to be seen, but I think the first task <laughs> is to make sure that Donald Trump never gets close uh, to the White House again. Well, I think that's maybe a good point to, to close. Now, I have to say to people, you really need to read this book because uh, it's got a lot more. and We haven't really had a chance to, to cover a lot of it. So uh, do read it. But meanwhile, uh, thank you very much, Gerald, uh, for giving your time. And I hope it encourages people to get involved in this and, and understand what's at stake. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it.